All right, today we're going to be talking about Lesson 15 in the Doctrine and Covenants, or Church History Lessons. And I'm starting today in History of the Church. This is Volume 1 of History of the Church, page 163. And the majority of this lesson focuses on Section 46 of the Doctrine and Covenants, which was received uh, by Joseph Smith on March 8th of 1831. So we're still very early in the church. Um, history, quite frankly, there hasn't even been a one-year mark, hasn't passed for an anniversary of the church. And uh, as we're looking at this um, section, as you can tell here, um, this is outlined in the history of the church, volume 1, page 163. But there's this nice little footnote that B.H. Roberts gave us right here. Um, and it says, Doctrine and Covenants, uh, and at that time, it was a different section. I can't read Roman numerals off the top of my head, but this is section 46 as we know it now. I think previously in the um, 1835 edition, this was under a chapter heading, chapter 16, I believe. Um, and I think it was also the uh, same in the 1833 edition of the Book of Commandments. Anyway, this is something that John Taylor wrote here about the first seven verses. He writes, um, in the beginning of the church, that these, oh, there it is. In the beginning of the church, here we go. While yet in her infancy, the disciples used to exclude, used to exclude the unbelievers, which caused some to marvel and converse of this manner because of the things written in the Book of Mormon, specifically 3rd Nephi. Uh, 20 or sorry 18 22 through 34 therefore the lord designed or dined to speak on this subject that his people might come to understanding and said that he had always given to his elders conduct all meetings as they were led by the spirit so those are some words from john taylor about this section before we um, go much deeper all right now we're going to turn to the actual uh, chapter or section in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 46. As I mentioned earlier, it was received in, on March 8, 1831. We don't have a lot of background on this, um, except for that it was to give us some more understanding as to how um, uh, people who are not of our faith should be treated. And then it also goes into uh, quite an extensive uh, thing about the uh, gifts of the, the Spirit, outlines the gifts of the Spirit. So here we go. Let's, let's look at this and kind of go through it. Hearken, O ye people of my church, for verily I say unto you that these things were spoken unto you by unto you for your profit and learning. Okay, that's, that's good. These things are spoken unto you for your profit and learning. Nothing wrong with that. We know that. We want to pay attention. Whenever we see hearken, it means pay attention, listen up. O ye people of my church, um, that's an interesting phrase because, quite frankly, we're not, um, in our day, hear this being made in 2017, we tend to think of the church as being an institution. We, we think of it being an organization, um, an it, kind of like a corporation, um, a business, it's a church, it's something separate and apart from us. Unfortunately, that's not what church actually means in the scriptures. In the scriptures, what church means is those who are gathered who are believers. That's what church means. It means an assembly of those who are seeking to know God, um, those who are forsaking their sins. So when it says people of my church, it's, it's talking about you. If you are a believer, if you're repenting, if you're coming to know Christ, he's talking to you. Hearken, pay attention, listen up. Hey, do you hear me? Verily I say unto you, now verily is a word that means of a truth, right? So it means I'm speaking a truth to you. Verily I say unto you, these things were spoken unto you for your profit and learning. I'm telling you these things so you can profit. Profit not in a monetary sense, but profit in a spiritual sense. Learning. Remember, no man can be saved in ignorance or woman. None of us can be saved in ignorance. We have to learn the things of God. Uh, if you can't be ignorant and return into God's presence, then you ought to be learning something. You ought to be taking your time and learning as much as you can. All right, verse 2. But notwithstanding those things which are written, it always has been given to the elders of my church from the beginning, and ever shall be, to conduct all meetings as they are directed and guided by the Holy Spirit. So, 
regardless of what you read, see otherwise, or hear, you're supposed to conduct meetings as they're directed and guided by the Holy Spirit. Now, why would that be? Why would the Spirit be required to guide and direct meetings? Why would elders be in charge of it? Well, and if you'll recall at this time, there weren't um, a ton of offices in the church. There's the option to have members. There's the option to have elders. Elders are those who hopefully at this time have received priesthood, but they may not have. Uh, priesthood and office in the church were two separate and distinct things in the early church. Um, but at the same time, he wants us to conduct the means by the Holy Spirit. In other words, he doesn't want everything necessarily planned out. And if the Spirit indicates that you should be doing something different, you should be doing that. Um, conduct them according to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is your connection to Christ, your connection to God. So if you don't have that connection to God, according to section 121, you don't even have priesthood. So you can lose it. So you've got to have that connection that connection to God and to Christ and to the Spirit. All right, moving on. Verse 3. Nevertheless, we are commanded never to cast anyone out from your public meetings which are held before the world. Okay, so in other words, visitors are welcome, right? And you see that on most LDS chapels. Visitors are welcome. Ye are commanded. So this is a commandment. So when we think about commandments, this is one of them. We have it here in our Doctrine and Covenants. You are commanded not to cast anyone out. So in other words, don't kick people out. Let people come in. If you're holding a public meeting, keep people in. Now, you also got to remember that back in this time, the church did not have any church meeting houses. Everybody, uh, you met in homes or you met in the Bowery's, or you met in uh, forests, or in parks, so to speak. Uh, they put down a log, and people would sit down on the log, and you'd talk. And it was out in the, you know, in the fields. That's where people congregated to hear the Word of God. Those were the public meetings. So, don't cast people out. Why would that be? Why would Christ say, don't cast people out? That's something to think about and to answer when you have a minute. All right, moving on to verse 4. Ye are also commanded not to cast anyone who belongeth to the church out of your sacrament meetings. Nevertheless, if any have trespassed, let him not partake until he makes reconciliation. All right, so this is where some uh, people uh, say, hey, the, the bishop can, if you go in and confess your sins to the bishop, the bishop can say, hey, look, you know what? You're, you can't have the sacrament for a month or two months or three months or maybe a year. Uh, you're on informal probation in the LDS church. This is this is where they get this for a basis, right? You're commanded uh, to not cast anyone out who belongs to the church. So investigators are welcome. Anyone's welcome. Muslims are welcome. Christians are welcome. Jews are welcome. Whoever you are, you're welcome. The heathen is welcome. But... If you belong to the, the church, you're also not to be kicked out. You're, you're allowed to be there as well. And, and you know what? This is talking about a sacrament meeting. So we've got public meetings. Now he's talking about sacrament meetings, which makes one think that perhaps a sacrament meeting is not a public meeting. That's something to consider as well. And then he says, wait, wait a minute. If any have trespassed, if any have done anything wrong, which would probably be all of us, right? Let him not partake until he makes reconciliation. What does it mean to reconcile? What does reconciliation mean? How do you reconcile so that you can partake of the sacrament? That's something to think about. Reconciliation. Is reconciliation required with man? And if it's required with man, to what extent is it re required for men? Or is it required for, to reconcile with God? Uh, something to consider as we move on to verse 5. I can give you my thoughts, but my thoughts aren't necessarily right. And nor are they what you should necessarily be paying attention to. You really should be paying attention to 
God and what he reveals to you, not what I reveal to you, because I could be wrong. Verse 5, and again, I say unto you, ye shall not cast any out of your sacrament meetings who are earnestly seeking the kingdom. I speak this concerning those who are not of the church. So wait a minute here. He's saying again, don't cast anyone out of your sacrament meetings if they are earnestly seeking the kingdom. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to earnestly seek the kingdom? How do you earnestly seek the kingdom? What is the kingdom? Christ said, my kingdom is not of this world. So it's someone who's seeking the kingdom, meaning a government position, or is it the kingdom referring to something on the other side of the veil? Um, Earnestly seeking. We are taught in the Sermon on the Mount, in the Sermon at Bountiful, to uh, ask, seek, and knock. For what? What are we supposed to ask, seek, and knock for? That's something to think about. Obviously, we don't want to be ignorant. We've learned that. We want to have things for our profit and learning. But if we're earnestly seeking the kingdom, we're taught here to seek the kingdom of God, right? That's what it is, is the kingdom of God. How do you earnestly seek for that? If you are earnestly seeking for the kingdom of God, is it something you do on Sundays only? Or is it something that you do on a daily basis? Is it something you do when you wake up in the morning that you immediately fall on your knees and pray to God and thank God for another day of life that you can try to become like Him, that you can do good in this world, that you can make amends with anyone that you may have offended, that you can go out and spread the gospel, that you can do good works, that people can see your good works and they can glorify God for what you've done because you're not going to say, look at me, I'm so great and wonderful. You're going to say, look at him. He's great and wonderful. Earnestly seek the kingdom. What can you do to earnestly seek the kingdom? Well, don't cast anyone out of the sacrament means we're told again. Let's keep going in verse 6. And again, I say unto you concerning your confirmation meetings, that if there be any that are not of the church, that are earnestly seeking after the kingdom, ye shall not cast them out. Well, what is a confirmation meeting? Confirmation meetings were those where people who had recently been baptized, they would go and um, they would have a meeting where they would be confirmed uh, members of the church and they would receive the ordinance of the laying on of the hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. So even those who are not of the church are not to be cast out. Again, if they are earnestly seeking the kingdom, don't cast them out. How do you know, I've asked this before, how do you know if someone's earnestly seeking the kingdom? Because this is the second time that we're seeing this here in Scripture. Something to think about, something to consider as we move on to verse 7. But ye are commanded in all things to ask of God. Well, I'm going to stop right there. Why in the world would this be put in verse 46 or verse 7 in section 46? We're talking about baptism, we're talking about confirmation, we're talking about earnestly seeking the kingdom. We're talking about that all meetings should be guided by the Holy Spirit. And then it says, you're commanded in all things to ask of God. Now, you see in my scriptures that that's underlined. I would suggest and recommend to you that you ask God in all things that are important to you. Everything that you do in your life where you're going to make a choice, a decision that and not just has eternal consequences, because all things have eternal consequences. I mean, in the, in the end of things, every moment of your life is important and valuable. But we all know that, that Christ probably doesn't care what brand of um, chili you're going to eat tonight, right? He, he probably doesn't care if you're going to have chicken or beef in your sandwich. Um, he probably doesn't care if you're drinking lemonade or just water. Those things probably don't matter much to God. But here we're told, you're commanded in all things to ask of God. All things. All things. Is there anything that would be too trite to ask God about? Now, let's be honest. I just made some comments about eating what brand of chili or whether you're drinking lemonade or water. Quite frankly, I don't think that God really cares about those things. But if you think he does, you should ask him. 
because God is no respecter of persons. He, he does not care if you're wealthy or poor. He does not care of your social standing in this world. He, he just doesn't care. He, he loves everyone. And so if you are concerned about something, he is concerned about something. So ask God if you're concerned about anything. And if you're not concerned about some things, perhaps you ought to be, right? And, and specifically your own eternal salvation. Because that's really what God wants, right? We talked about, everybody knows, Moses 139, for this is my work and my glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. And if that's his work and his glory is you, to bring about your eternal life and to bring about your exaltation, then he's going to care about you. He's going to love you. He's going to want you to ask him about all things. Because how intimately ought God to know you, and how intimately ought you to know your God. You ought to be intimate with him, and he ought to be intimate with you. And therefore, you're commanded, this is a commandment, are you keeping this commandment? In all things to ask of God, all things, all things ask God, who giveth liberally, the scripture says. Of course, this is mirroring, uh, you know, John uh, or sorry, not John, James, James 1, 5 and 6, right? James, the culprit of the restoration. Who giveth liberally and that which the Spirit testifies unto you, even so I would that ye should do in all holiness of heart, walking uprightly before me, considering the end of your salvation, doing all things with prayer and thanksgiving, that ye may not be seduced by evil spirits or doctrines of, the, of devils or the commandments of men, for some are of men and others of devils. Think about that. This verse here stands out somewhat different than the prior verses because we are being taught here that Christ wants us to be holy. He says what we should do, we should do it in holiness of heart. Walking uprightly before me, considering the end of your salvation. Now, now notice those are three things. It's a kind of a, a triplet there. So what you do, you do it in holiness of heart, right? And I would suggest that he's talking about all things. He's not just talking about what you do on Sunday in your sacrament meeting or in a confirmation meeting. He's talking about all things. Walk uprightly before him. What does it mean to walk uprightly? Straight, sturdy, looking perhaps up towards the heavens, right? Where he dwells. And considering the end of your salvation, we ought to keep in mind our salvation. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And then doing all these things with prayer and thanksgiving. Thanksgiving that we don't fall into temptation. Temptation being evil spirits, doctrines of devils, or commandments of men. How do we know if we're being taught a commandment of men? How do we know if we're being seduced by an evil spirit? Well, Mormon teaches us that, or sorry, Moroni does, that he says anything that's good is of God, and 